Hey, dear ones, God bless you, and thanks a lot for tuning in. What you're about to watch is a reflection that I made on the subject of where the church is and where the church isn't. Uh, this subject is uh, commonly talked about by believers. It's very important uh, with some fine distinctions, and I hope it will be edifying for you. God be with you. Sometimes uh, people repeat this interesting statement. Um, I've heard it many times over the, the years of my priesthood that we know where the church is, but we don't know where the church isn't. Have you ever heard that statement before? It's very common and it's hideously wrong. <laughs> uh, the church is not an invisible being. It's not an invisible body. Uh, we know the church where the church is as much as you know where your own body is. You don't have an invisible body and the church is not invisible. Uh, we know exactly where the church is and where the church isn't. But that can't be said of the Holy Spirit. We don't know. We know where the Holy Spirit is, vivifying the church, inspiring her mysteries, sanctifying her people, and making saints. But we, we don't know where he is working outside of the church, and he certainly is. In fact, uh, remember John chapter 3, where the Holy Spirit is described as a wind, and you know the wind by its effects. You don't know. You, you don't see it. Uh, this is a description of the Spirit's work. And he, wherever there is someone repenting of their sins, when, wherever there is someone coming to uh, the knowledge of the truth, we see the work of the Spirit of God. So absolutely 100%, uh, he's working and trying to save mankind in every land of the whole earth. Uh, and can nurse prayer wherever the name of Christ is called upon, wherever someone authentically calls Jesus Lord, that conviction uh, is, is, is a work of the Holy Spirit. Take, for example, the life of Cornelius the centurion. This is described in Acts chapter 10. He was a pagan Roman uh, centurion, but he admired the people of God and was imitating their prayers uh, at the hour of prayer that was going on in the temple. He would go in, into his own home and lift his prayer to God, and God respected him. He respected him, and he sent an angel to him in response to his pious prayers, and he then directed him to meet St. Peter. He sent his servants to get him, uh, who was, he, Peter was staying at Simon the Tanner's house, and told Peter to come and bring this man into a knowledge of the truth and to baptize him. So, here we have a good example of how the Spirit of God works. He works with a person who turns their heart to him. Uh, he, he inspires his prayer. He responds to him. Uh, and then he helps him get into the church. So because you have a spiritual experience, because someone calls on the name of Christ, for instance. I'll, I'll give you a practical example. I met with a man today. I have On Thursdays, I meet with people all day long. Visitors, inquirers, and parishioners. I met with a man today who uh, has been drawn by God to the church. He's been coming to the church now for some time, uh, but God just found him. God found him. He called on the name of God when he was a drug addict, and he was at the end of his rope. He called on Jesus's name and said, Lord, if you don't save me today, I'm going to die. And literally at that moment, Jesus saved him from drug addiction. This was over 10 years ago, and he hasn't used drugs since. He hasn't even had an urge to use, drug, use drugs. And he knew as soon as he said the name Jesus that he was healed. And now he's being brought to the church to get rooted and planted in the, in the body of Christ. So we don't have to, to suggest it would be folly to suggest that the Spirit of God is not working all over the place. He is. And that also that he works to bring people to the church. The folly is to suggest that you don't know where the church is and that somehow the church exists invisibly here or there. Uh, that would, of course, negate the need for someone to be baptized and to come into the church and settle their relationship with God. I tell them it's the difference between dating God and becoming one flesh with him, right? You might call on the name of Jesus. You might read the New Testament and be touched. The Spirit of God may convict you of sin, uh, but that's the beginning of a relationship that needs to become official and solidified by a spiritual marriage, which is called baptism in the church. Patristic Nectar Publications is pleased to present a new six-part lecture series by Father Josiah Trenum entitled Demonology, Understanding and Winning the Spiritual Battle. 
The study of the church's demonology is a part of basic catechism and Christian instruction. The scriptures are replete with teaching on the dark powers. Additionally, it is impossible to appreciate the magnitude of the saving deeds of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, without understanding how He, and He alone, has conquered Satan and destroyed His works. Lastly, Christians are called to fight and win in the spiritual war. And for this reason, it is essential that believers understand their enemies and their tactics. Toward this end, Father Josiah presents in these lectures in-depth studies of the scriptures, divine services, and pedagogy of great saints and teachers on the subject of Satan and spiritual battle. For these and other available titles, please visit our website at patristicnectar.org.